What we breathe affects all of us and kills many of us. Over 8 million people are killed every year as a result of airborne transmitted illness. I'm going to share with you a few stories about why we must think of air pollution as our most urgent and critical crisis. And then I'll share how we're going to fix it. We'll start with those stories. I was a young boy, and it was a midsummer morning in North Dakota. I was outside, and I was laying on the greenest bed of grass I could ever imagine. As I looked up, I noticed that there was a singing meadow lark. I stood up and took an amazingly deep breath, maybe the best breath of my life. As I surveyed my surroundings, I noticed that there was a drilling rig on the edge of the ridge. That was my dad's rig. I was so excited. That was where I was going to get to go to work the next day with my dad. This was a time long before safety rules. And any 10-year-old could get away with walking around a rig site. I marveled at the way the roughnecks used what seemingly was small tools on massive pipes. They could move things with great ease. My father, who was a roughneck, then a driller, and eventually a rig superintendent, would check on me that day from time to time. But I got bored quickly, and I escaped, wandering around the rig site. I climbed over the large piles of earth, circled around the drilling mud pit, and navigated the maze of pipes and cables and equipment and the massive diesel engines. Twelve years later, I'm back in the oil fields of North Dakota. I'm working one summer before starting medical school. Driving truck from oil rig to oil rig, I see the beauty of the North Dakota Plains. As I turn my rig down a rough and rocky gravel road, that beauty is now interrupted as I noticed a large 100-foot derrick. Stopping, I jumped out in a cloud of dust and then started my journey up those 22 steps to the oil drilling platform. At the top, I found that I was coughing and wheezing and violently coughing like never before. For I had been inhaling the invisible fumes of gas, of oil, and diesel. The exhaust from the diesel engines and who knows what else. Fast forward, and it's 2017. I'm starting to develop an interest in airborne transmitted illness. It turns out that that, that airborne disease kills far more people than any infectious diseases, such as the flu or SARS-CoV-2. And those numbers, they're increasing. As an anesthesiologist and an intensive care physician, I've cared for more than 10,000 people on ventilators. So I've learned a few things about breathing, and I've learned a few things about not breathing. But none of that prepared me for the striking results of the Global Burden of Disease study. Their scientists look at risks and diseases from around the world, and they have concluded that air pollution is responsible for 25% of all heart attacks, 25% of all vascular disease, and 25% of all strokes. And don't forget, of course, there's cancer and asthma, other lung diseases, and the surprise for me, 16% of all dementia is a result of air pollution. These small particles are so small, they're invisible to the human eye. An invisible killer. The air we breathe is not safe. 99% of us, 
live in areas that do not meet the latest World Health Organization standards for air quality. Air pollution, combustion, climate change, they are all interconnected. We are sitting at a convergence of air pollution and combustion, climate and conflict. The only solution is less. Many will suggest to you that the electrification of our system is the answer to all air pollution and to all climate change. It's not the case. In the past 20 years, our demands for electricity in this country are up 6%. The United States Department of Energy will tell us that we consume electricity that is generated 61% by coal and gas, 19% by nuclear, and 20% by renewables. Nuclear power is our best option for zero carbon energy. But nuclear power plants are closing, they're not being replaced, and utility companies are forced just to burn more coal and natural gas to make up the difference. Renewables, they are wonderful, but they can be expensive, slow, and difficult to integrate. Where will all the electricity come from? Recently, over 200 scientists were examining the impact of 34,000 studies on climate. And they, of course, have concluded that climate change is real. I'm not here to debate whether or not there will be long-term consequences from what's happening on our planet today. But I can tell you, we are changing the surface of the globe. As an example, the Sahara Desert has been expanding and advancing for decades. Just recently, sandstorm Celia carried millions of tons of sand and dust and ultrafine particulates across the Mediterranean. The skies over Spain turned red, and the entire country was covered with dust, fine red dust that filtered down. Millions of women who were pregnant and children were exposed. Ultrafine particle exposure during pregnancy permanently alters newborn immune function and lung function. Childhood exposure may alter neurodevelopmental and contribute to cognitive delay. As we find this self, ourselves at this convergence of crises, the only solution to air pollution is less. Because with less energy consumption, we have less combustion. With less combustion, we have less air pollution. And with less air pollution, we have less disease and dying. There are many around the globe, in fact, millions that are involved in energy production. Here in Oklahoma, that sector contributes $60 billion to the local economy, half of it in wages. We are really dependent upon electricity today because we cannot decrease our energy consumption at the same time that we have increasing electrical demands. It's incompatible. And so, in many ways, we really can't live with much less energy today, in the near term. But in the future, we can. In the future, we must do with less. The latest report published two days ago from the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change summarized a number of findings. Specifically, they said air pollution still going up. 
Carbon dioxide, still going up. They talked about the urgency of the situation. In fact, they said basically, it's now or it's never. To cure humanity, we must first cure the planet. And that begins with one less. Ask yourself, how many cars do you drive? How many rooms do you heat in your home? How many appliances do you have? How many trips do you take? Perhaps you could take one less. The treatment for pollution and for our planet and the inhabitants for these ails is one less. Perhaps it's one less flight, one less device, one less latte. For some, it might be one less car. And for others, maybe it's as simple as one less light left on. Examine your life. Decide. Decide right now. What is it that you can do tonight and tomorrow to enable one less in your life? It's a way of examining our actions, and it's a way of taking action, one less. Would you join us and be the first followers that are so crucial in a one less movement? You should, because your breath depends on it. Thank you.